I'm happy to be back. We have so much fun in Poland all last week in Warsaw and now Katowice. Uh, the fun is in the after party and the concerts and meeting you and talking with you. So let's see. I hope this will. Do I have to hold the microphone? Probably the best thing. Okay. Okay, so I have about 45 slides and I have about 40 minutes and then you have a break. Uh, so uh, my theme is how to plan or how to design for the unknown, for the unknown future. Uh, by the way, uh, I've put the talk, uh, if you take a quick photograph, anyway, uh, tinyurl slash wudgilb, the slides are there right now and they will be other places. I will uh, Twitter them and LinkedIn them a little bit later today and things like that. The last slide will also have a reminder of where they are, but if you wanted to follow the slides right now, that's a possibility. Um, oh, uh, by the way, there's a subtitle here that may interest somebody. How many people are UX people? Is that anybody here? Ah, okay. So I have a new concept for you. UX engineering, not UX art, okay? And UX engineering is not necessary for small projects. US art is fine, okay? And building a dog's house or a doll's house, no problem, you don't need an engineer or an architect. But many of our projects are huge and complex and Europe-wide uh, or you know, take an air traffic control system for Europe or a health system for Poland. They are huge, complex living systems. And if you're going to build a 200-story skyscraper, you know you need architecture and engineering. Okay? If you're going to build a really, design a really large system, some of us must go to the engineering paradigm, a little bit more discipline to get it right, to design right. So that's what the UX is. And I'm going to show you some UX engineering ideas. Uh, we did a four-hour seminar or workshop on it last night. About 16, 20 people attended. Uh, some of it will look a little bit scary if you don't like numbers or maths and don't like engineering. And I'm sorry. Relax. Just do small projects, but don't uh, threaten humanity by doing really large projects. Okay? Uh, so some of us are going to have to go through a painful transition of becoming more disciplined to contribute to design of really large, great uh, humankind, society-wide systems. Um, okay. So, I, I just for, uh, by the way, I'm also going to go through some slides rather rapidly, so don't think we're going to go through everything in detail, but sometimes just to give you an impression is the idea. Okay. And some things that look complex here can actually be surprisingly simple and can also be applied in small-scale projects and systems. So you don't have to have a large-scale system to do this kind of thinking. But if you have a large-scale system, I believe you have to do this kind of thinking to be successful. So I just made a list of things that can surprise us, things we'd like to know in the crystal ball. Okay, an obvious list. I, I like this uh, citation, if you aren't surprised by what you learn about users, you're doing it wrong. Something like that. Something to think about. Now, here's something I added uh, yesterday as a result of an experience on the uh, uh, master class in Warsaw last week. Uh, we had a quite surprising epiphany. How many people here do uh, one of the following at least? Uh, agile, lots of people, right? Lean, lots of, okay, okay. Uh, Kanban, ever, aha, uh -huh, okay. Uh, Anybody? Uh, okay, so that's that's enough. Now here are some unknown, an unknown situation. Okay, let's just say you went to Japan to find out about their development methods. Uh, Toyota, very successful, nice car, right? And some Americans actually made that trip and they visited Toyota. They found out the secret sauce, secret way of doing great things. Okay, but there was a, one one unknown they were facing was the Japanese spoke Japanese and they didn't. And in a sense, uh, everything you want to know was in Japanese, not in English, okay? Uh, there's another uh, thing there. There's the real method actually used in a complex factory uh, inside Toyota. And then there's this simple description externally to the Americans. Okay? We're, we're describing what was going to be known as lean, okay? And other similar things. And then there's a, a unknown motivation. You're talking to a very nice man. His name is Ono. 
and uh, he has a secret motivation. He would like to uh, support his home country, Japan. You know, okay. Would you like to support your home country, Poland? Yeah. Okay. We all feel a little bit nationalistic. We're brought up that way. Uh, but he also wants to make sure that he uh, defeats any European competitors like Poland or USA. Okay. That's what the Second World War was fought about, by the way. Okay. Uh, and then there's another problem. Uh, this method that is being taught to you by them, uh, we don't know what the results are or will be. We just think Toyota is good, so the answer is it must be good. Okay? So the, the sum of all this is you get unknown results if you lose, uh, use lean and scrum and any of the derivatives. So here is Mr. Ono, uh, father of Toyota production system, but in fact, uh, from our Western point of view, father of lean. Okay. And not only lean, but uh, quite a few other uh, things like lean, Kanban, uh, Kaizen, which is the same as iterative improvement or agile, right? And Muda, waste in work, you know, some of these concepts, okay? So he wrote some books about it, and, uh, or, or at least, uh, yeah, the American translation of the method. Now, uh, uh, I was studying some of these methods. One of them is called Probably, how many people know a method called quality function deployment, QFD? Okay, a few. It's uh, like in, it, it comes from Toyota 2, same package, and it's used to analyze designs, multiple designs, against multiple objectives. Okay? So I've been analyzing that method for years, and I found it very, very bad method. I said, you couldn't possibly succeed with this method. It's too unclear, too arbitrary. Uh, I, 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 and as a joke, I said, I think this method is, is a Japanese conspiracy to defeat the West. They've actually given disinformation about a bad method, pretending it's their good method, hoping that the West will be stupid enough to swallow the method and, and make bad cars. Okay? And I've been saying this joke for years. So I was saying this joke in uh, our class in Warsaw uh, last week, and uh, uh, Wukash uh, uh, was there. and. It, Wukash is down at the bottom there. Uh, and, and he said, uh, Tom, this is not a joke that the Japanese were doing disinformation about lean. It is now proven. I said, you're joking. You know, my theory is finally proven. Uh, I said, can you prove it? Can you give me the documentation? And he did. And here it is. Okay? Look at this. Okay, when the Americans and Europeans, maybe there were some Polish people there, came to visit Toyota, he did his best to confuse them as to why Toyota was so successful. He said, I explained it by talking about techniques, you know, Muda, Kaizen, Japanese words, you know, lean and everything like that. A quicker machine setups, you know, think velocity in Scrum with Jeff Sutherland for a moment. A reduction of the seven wastes, Muda, and other Japanese names like Kanban and Kaizen. Kaizen, kissing cousin of Agile, if you didn't know, continuous improvement. Okay? I did my best to prevent the visitors from fully grasping our overall approach. Wow. We've been living a lie for a long time. Okay? Uh, so now he said, I'm ready to talk about it. Here is a man who has visited Poland a few times and influenced. How many people have encountered Jeff Sutherland at a conference here or a course or anything? Not, not too many of you. Okay. But uh, he spoke at the uh, Agile conference in Warsaw about 2013. And uh, uh, now when he talks about the roots of Scrum, how many people have some relationship to Scrum in their working environment? Quite a lot. Yeah? Okay. Uh, he specifically cites Ono and other related people, right? By the way, he also cites Tom Gilb as the source of his ideas, but we've, I'm not giving you disinformation. I promise you, no fake news today from me. Uh, he has a charming, he had made a charming presentation. He said, ordinary uh, uh, agile only has complete failure of project 40% of the time. Scrum is much better. It only fails 19% of the time. And I was like, what? You are bragging about failing one-fifth of the time? Okay. 
Imagine you go to a heart surgeon. You're going to get a new heart. You say, are you a good, trustworthy heart surgeon? Do you have a good method? He said, yes, I'm the best heart surgeon in Poland. Oh, good. So how good are you? Well, the other heart surgeons, they kill two patients out of five. I only kill one patient out of five. And don't worry, I've just done four successful operations, and you're next. That's us. These are the methods we use lead directly to that failure. That scrum you just admitted you use leads directly to this rate of failure because it's not very good. Okay, there are better things, and I'd like to try to bring better things to Poland. Okay, so that's really the content of my talk. Okay, so uh, okay, I'm probably already way behind in the time, but I hope. You you thought it was fun to start that way. Now you're thinking, my God, have we been fooled all this time by buying these great American ideas from Japan? I think Polish people are, and you are so smart that you should be able to see what is a bad method, even if it comes from America, and maybe invent a Polish method which works better. Okay, so let's stop swallowing all this junk coming to us from overseas. They're very good at selling it, aren't they? Right? But it doesn't work very well. We've got to find something better or society will collapse in the, all the large-scale UX projects we make. Okay? So the, um, the first sort of tool for uh, dealing with the unknown is quite simply to stop working down there at the detailed level of the design, okay? We're designers, so we'd like to think at design level. But to raise your sights to the vision, the higher level idea of, for example, how much user friendliness you want, not which keyboard or microphone or touch screen you're going to use, right? No, you, in other words, don't start with UI. Start with UX, which is trying to go broad to all the user experiences. Start with a high level vision of the accessibility for the handicapped. Okay. Maybe you have to because of European laws, but maybe it's, it's part of our design anyway. Is it start with that? How good do you want that to be? The user experience level, right? Then work your way down to the design. Okay. Now what happens is even if there are some unknown technologies going to come in your future or during your project, you, you're not committed to a specific technology when you start. You're just committed to a specific result: good accessibility, good usability. Right. So now you are free to pick the best technology, the unknown technology, which is much better for you, which is emerging. Right. You, in other words, make yourself free of the technology idea. Be driven by the user experience visions or views of the qualities of the system the user wants to experience. That's really what I'm saying there. Here's a very simple practical example. This is a uh, project I did at uh, Ericsson of Sweden. It's called AriEye. You can look it up. It's an airplane uh, designed to compete with the AWAX systems of the Americans. So it's a, I say it's a spy plane, and my Swedish friends know it's not a spy plane. It's a surveillance plane. They don't want to have that word spy on them. But uh, basically, it you know, uh, takes pictures and gathers data from the air. Um, now, the, the, the AREI system had the characteristic that it's supposed to be much cheaper than AWACS. So they had two operators on board. AWACS system has 20, 10 times more. Okay, so how do you do all the similar functionality and quality with two people? The, bri the gap has to be bridged by software. Okay, and the software, so they told me on day one of the project, I said, what is the most important user experience, we didn't use that term, but we could use it today. And they said, usability, that's number one. That's, uh, we, that's how we m make two people do the work of 20. And that's the whole point of the system. At that point, we knew something about how to quantify usability, which I talked about last year. So I refer you to that talk and I have a reference to it uh, at the bottom. Uh, but uh, at one point, we reached a point where we had different kinds of usability, and one of them was intuitiveness, and another was intelligibility, and we had never quantified those before. We had never clarified those before. But we sat down that same first morning of the project, and we said, let's be really clear about what it means, intuitiveness and intelligibility. And the, the, the method I use is let's quantify it. Let's put a number on it so we can measure it. Now we're entering engineering. 
instead of just waving our arms, great usability, we are saying it means exactly this on this scale of measure, uh, here is the worst, uh, worst case level, and here is the goal level, right? That's, uh, and these are simplified versions of what we did, but uh, it'll, it'll do for the... So here you see, in simple firm, well-defined user experience quantified, the beginning of what I call engineering, okay? Here's the plane and some remarks from the project manager about uh, the goodness of these uh, uh, quantified quality requirements. Here's another client of mine, this time a little company in Norway which uh, managed to get one half of the world market for what they did and sustain their business uh, successfully and profitably for many years. Uh, and that's not bad. How many Polish companies have 50% of the world market of anything? Uh, we were having this discussion and we didn't find a whole lot of Polish companies. But last week, a lot of people wanted to plan for uh, Polish leadership in, in some fields in, in the world. You know, maybe some big famous Polish companies uh, like Ikea or Amazon or Apple or something in that class, right? And it's difficult to find such companies but uh, maybe you will be a party to making it happen with your startups, why not? So here's a little Norwegian company. Norway is five million people, so you compare with population of Poland. But this little gang started up uh, uh, and uh, got half the world market. Long story short, they were under threat for two things. They didn't have good enough usability. It took one week course to learn to use their app. And this was preventing sales they could uh, make their sales 10 or 100 times larger if they could improve usability. So eight years after they started building their app, they re redesigned their app to build the usability in to make training close to zero and, uh, uh, and succeed in the market, which they in fact did. And uh, they actually um, engineered 10 different types of usability. Uh, in, in intuitiveness was one of them, here it is. Uh, and, uh, and 15 other qualities into the system, I won't go into them. Uh, here after one day of training, which we did for them, uh, and three months later are five of the most uh, radical quality improvements. Look at these numbers. Before it was this number and then after it is this number. And these are directly deriver delivered to the user experience. If you think about it, if you read them, these are directly time savings and other savings for users. Uh, and so what we experienced is that if we target, if we put a number on what we wanted and went for it, we would not only achieve all the numbers we set out, but sometimes in this case we'd overachieve with sensationally good qualities. This led directly and quickly, this company then destroyed their competition it took them over, bought them out. Nobody would buy any other uh, type of system than this one. Okay, so they literally destroyed the competition and took them over. So uh, no, imagine that a Polish company so good with quality that they destroy the worldwide competition because the user experience is so good, and you're the people who are going to make it happen. Okay, I'm, I'm telling you, we've done this. We've done this using what I call these engineering methods. Okay. Um, Here's another uh, example of uh, uh, just to show what we do. We take something like device interoperability. You know, you can use any uh, you know, uh, watch or phone or tablet or anything. And then one tactic we have to make things clearer is we divide this nice sounding word, we should have great device interoperability, into a set of sub-measures, uh, sub-qualities, uh, here's the list of them. I'm going to show you in more detail what we do with interaction capability, which I suppose is of some interest to you. But so this is a, I call Cartesian analysis, Rene Descartes. It's defining things by decomposing them. It's a very powerful idea. Now, this might be a problem, but what the heck. <laughs> uh, so here's device in interoperability. And here's what we call the management bullshit level, all information that is available in the desktop applications will be available on all smartphones, right? But here is a scale of measure, percentage of information supported on devices for a market, for a browser, for a personal computer. And all of these terms are now defined here, 
Okay, see the level of definition and decomposition? So we're getting, we're defining our user and our experience in extremely precise terms. We're, we're modeling or mapping our world of user experience far more precisely than maybe you are used to, or at least more systematically, even if you do the detail there. And so, uh, sorry about that. So uh, down, down here, we have a wish level. Uh, where, where let's say we wish to get 100%, but then we've picked some of these parameters for uh, information being situations, uh, the uh, supported parameter, notification only, devices, Android phones, market, SAAS, browser, Chrome for Android, person, subject matter, experts. You see how at the bottom, how we're picking uh, a slice of the action. In fact, what we do here is we say that first goal will be for the most critical of each one of those parameters, the most valuable. So we end up having a goal for the very most important thing. And we can then do that early, do that first on the first sprints. Okay, this is what Agile permits you to do is select some things and do them early. And that means we can deliver great results in the critical area very early without being encumbered by the building of a much larger system, which we will do in time until the, there is no payoff in adding more increments. Okay? But I give you this, uh, although a little bit of a culture shock, I'm sure, and it's, it's uh, not very enlarged on the screen, but that's the largest screen we can get in here, the football stadium. Uh, this, this is what I mean by engineering the user experience requirement. We did some exercises on this uh, couple hours last night in the workshop, for example. Another method um, for handling the unknown is what I call no cure, no pay contracting. And it's an incredibly simple idea. Uh, basically, you don't say, well, I'll pay you by the hour, or I'll pay you by the day, and I hope you're done sometime in writing code. This is like a sub-supplier of any kind. For example, our friends at Accenture. Okay? And uh, so payment by day or time is, is almost like what is your hourly rate is a question people ask, is really a, not such a smart idea. We are contracting and building to get a result. And I think if that result is well defined, and I just showed you an example of well defined, we can then use it in a contract and quite simply say, look, when you've delivered that goal level, and we will test and measure deliver. That use, when you've delivered the user experience, then we will pay you, and that's in the contract. So ha just suck on that idea a little bit. Okay? Define user experiences so well that you can subcontract, manage multinational teams based on one thing. Are they delivering the user experience? No matter how hard they work or how their hourly rate or their technology, either they deliver the user experience, which is primary, or we simply have a deal, we will not pay you and you have agreed to that. That will, of course, motivate them to deliver your user experience. Okay? Now, if you just start paying by the hour and you say, yeah, we want a great user experience, right? Well. A lot of companies will happily keep on consuming your money as long as you're dumb enough to pay the invoice for year after year. Or you maybe know that. These are called failed overrun projects. And suppliers happily take your money as long as you're fool enough to give it. You should not be fool enough to give it unless they have delivered your user experience. Okay? And you can, you can also pay in sprints or increments for incremental payment. Right? You don't have to wait to the end of a large project uh, six years and then pay. There's no such thing. Agile gives you the possibility of incremental payment based on user experience results. Doesn't that sound like a good idea, a responsible way of spending money for projects? Okay, there's a little bit more detail here, but uh, that's something you can study afterwards. Uh, we've worked out how to do this in practice. I've actually been doing it for decades in various ways. And I find it very powerful to make a contract, no cure, i.e. no user experience, no pay. That's simple. Okay. So uh, third method, take a look at the clock here. Uh, third method is, now this is evolutionary feedback and rev, uh, rapid lean learning. Uh, but, uh, and here we have a little cycle, which is sort of like a sprint. But there's a lot more measurement and measurable stuff built in. You know, see here it says measure 
learn, for example, and values are quantified, and solutions we even quantify how good they are. So this is the engineering. So this is our engineering cycle. And uh, now this is essentially what you perhaps call agile, but it's not Scrum. Okay. Scrum is missing the ideas of measurement and feedback of user experience. Now, Scrum would say, but Tom, Scrum is just a framework. You have to plug in your UX things into the Scrum framework to make. Don't you know that? You don't criticize Scrum for not having UX frameworks. It's your job to plug them in. Okay, I'm giving you some specific ideas of uh, um, things you can build into a Scrum framework. And my good friend Jeff Sutherland heartily agrees and has said in public that what I'm showing you is the most advanced good stuff they've ever seen in the Scrum environment. Have that in writing. Okay? So, you know, don't feel you're violating the religion of Scrum if you build in my methods. It's already approved by the high priest, Mr. Jeff Sutherland. Okay? We've got that in writing if you need it to prove it. Okay? So, uh, but, so, so, so we need to, here's a, just the big idea. We need to adapt our Scrum framework to the user experience process. And I'm offering one method for doing it. By the way, my methods are free. End of discussion, okay? You don't have to pay me any license, anything. Go on the internet, grab my stuff. I'm gonna offer you a free book on the subject at the end, okay? So, this, so there's, I'm not selling anything except the idea for no money, okay? And I'm really happy when people do as they're doing in Poland, adopt, use, and like the ideas, okay? Um, here's, um, here's more from that same little company that achieved so much on five of them. But uh, 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 So these are essentially spreadsheets tracking 25 user experiences, right, quantified, week by week. And de uh, they're delegating the power of design to the local team. Okay? They used to have a situation where the design was actually fed by the customers and salesmen. Do this design, do that. Have you ever been told to do a design that you felt was bad and stupid, but you're told the customer is paying so you do it? That's a very frustrating situation. Here, we, 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 we do like Steve Jobs. We say, we're not going to let the customer, we're not going to interview the customers and ask what they want. We're going to figure out they want insanely great user friendliness and we're going to give it to them. So the, what I'm recommending is exactly what Apple has done in this design. Okay, nothing, nothing, and very uh, incremental and evolutionary, as you know. Okay, so this, this, long story short, this little simple spreadsheet is a way of managing the increments of the project so that each increment you see how far you're getting, you're measuring the quality, you're measuring the user experience uh, factor uh, week by week and making decisions as to how to design it in a local four-person team, for example. Okay, so this uh, it, many of the ideals of uh, agile, of you know, delegation of authority and cooperation and teamwork, are embedded in this method in practice. But the, it's gui the, the the reason we can delegate authority is because we have the high-level quantified user experience. Okay, that they, they say you can do anything you want as long as you deliver the user experience, right? Then we can delegate power safely. If you don't have that, you get uh, micromanagement at the detailed level, which is what happens with user stories. By the way, having said user stories, okay, we need to change that for, to stakeholder stories, but I'll get back to that later in the talk. Okay, user stories far too, the whole you, at this conference is wrong. We need to, if we're gonna go UX, and we say we're gonna go broad, then we must go beyond the stakeholder, sorry, the user, to all the 50 other stakeholders. And I have some lists of them later in the talk. Okay, so let's, uh, next conference, let's not call it UX or something, let's call it SX, stakeholder experience. And if you think about it, we have to go in that direction if we're really going to subscribe to the ideal of the whole picture and not just uh, UI. Uh, here's some uh, uh, just advice I've been giving and taking and using in my own designs for decades, that whatever you do, you need to make the uh, uh, interface the, uh, adjustable by the user themselves, okay? You can't pre-program everything. Otherwise, there will always be lots and lots of things they want to do and, you know, try to say to 
even Apple or Microsoft, look, I want to adjust this, you know, you're not going to get a reply, let alone a no. Okay, it's impossible to communicate with, they just do their own thing. So, the, but, but individually, you, like you might want to adjust an uh, American app to Polish text, to take a simple example, you know, and that kind of thing. Uh, or you might want to use a different terminology because the terminology in the app is confusing, but you know, just locally for your team. So, uh, long story short, one way of handling the unknown, meaning what will the users really want, what will the stakeholders want, is to give them the possibility for doing what they want when they want it, so you don't have to know what they want, okay? And that's very good advice, and I've been following it for decades. Uh, uh, the advice is repeated by somebody, I'm sure many of you know Norman Nielsen Group, because they're some of the best usability people in the business, right? Great respect. And they very specifically give exactly that guideline in case you wonder. Okay, so that's quotation from there. Um, checking time. Okay, now I, I, uh, another way of handling the unknown, I call it dynamic design. Now, dynamic design really means at each sprint, at each loop, you, you measure the degree of experience you have delivered numerically and say, oh dear, I thought I would get 10, but I only got five. This is not good. My design is not working, right? They say, now I have to redesign right now, okay, so that I hopefully get up to 10 on the next iteration. So this is, di so design is not up front before the project starts. When you're doing agile, uh, and uh, you have an opportunity at each agile step, call it a sprint if you like, I prefer to call it value delivery steps, UX value delivery steps. If the numbers say you're not achieving what you want, then the UX designer, that's you, must come in there and redesign immediately that week and give it a new trial. You can't wait until 50 steps later and two years later and say, oh dear, the project fails. That's what bad Agile does. 40% total failure, good scrum, 19% failure, right? Zero failure of project should be your objective. Like bridge builders have failure rates of 0 0.01. That's where we need to get. 19 is ridiculous. And unfortunately, it's been persistent for decades, okay? So uh, here's a, a guy who's uh, done it, Harlan Mills at IBM. Uh, and uh, he's, he, he's uh, doing very early large-scale agile at uh, IBM Federal Systems Division called the Clean Room Method. And he's very successful, everything on time, fixed by deadline by NASA with the, regarding this planetary position of the stars. Please, God, my UX project is late. Would you stop Mars for a moment? doesn't work at NASA. They have deadlines which are set by God, quite literally, okay? And then the fixed price contractor, so uh, I need some more money doesn't count. You just have to spend, spend your own money if you run over. So they had to learn to control the fixed price, fixed deadline contract with extremely high quality, military and space UX qualities, okay? And, uh, but they, uh, this is in the 1980s, now here's examples of projects including Space Shuttle, for example, in 45 incremental deliveries. So clearly what we today call Agile. We did Agile then, okay? So here is where, here's the good Agile, the Agile that tackles the most complex problems, military and space, the highest user experience qualities, the uh, uh, at fixed price, fixed deadline, and always succeeds year after year. Now, doesn't that sound like a project management method you'd like to know about? You didn't know about it? Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. If you don't know this history, you're going to waste decades of your life failing. Okay? But this is, there is, this, this is the good agile that works. Okay? It's, if you like, it's Scrum with the right plugins, so it works. Okay? Um, see? Okay. Here's the architect, Quinnen talking about his process of architecting at each interval. We won't go into tremendous detail there, but that's the principle. Uh, you can get all of this off of the web if you want it, by the way. Uh, I did start a little bit late, but I highly respect the idea that you need a break. 
maybe on time and all of it. So I'm going to uh, skip a little bit, uh, go to the fun bits, and uh, you know you can, uh, when we have more time, can give you this stuff. Here's some more stakeholder stuff. Here's what we did um, in uh, last year in Katowice. We held a, a master class. And long story, we decided to tackle a big problem. Knowledge spreading in Poland. All knowledge in all of Poland. Big project, right? Uh, and for fun, here, by the way, on the left-hand side, you see the stakeholder list. That's how many stakeholders we had. Okay? Uh, let's see, do I have a bigger, maybe not of that. Okay, so here you see this stakeholder territory, which is enormously larger than the user territory. But stakeholders want experiences too, not just users. Okay, whatever stakeholder is. That's the main message. And here we are doing it in various ways in Poland for Polish projects. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna skip a little bit. It's mainly because I don't have more time. And um, uh, these uh, okay. So here, okay, here's more stakeholder stuff, right? Uh, all you need to do is get this visual impression. Stakeholders are maybe like 50 in any project we tackled in Poland. So how many stakeholders do you consider for the stakeholder experience? Oh, just the user? What about the other 49? You're missing it. If you're missing them, your project will fail. To satisfy the other 49, therefore your project will fail. Doesn't matter how satisfied the users are. We've got to get away from this narrow user, 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 and get over to stakeholder experiences. Okay? Here uh, is also uh, exporting startup things. Uh, we did a Polish project. These are the stakeholders for exporting uh, Polish startup things. Okay? A little bit, little bit more readable. Okay? Okay, so let's see. Now, uh, literally don't have more time except to have a little bit of fun and wind down and give you a break. So here uh, is a link. You can photograph it. You can get the slides, okay, which gives you a free booklet, 100 Practical Planning Principles. Enjoy. Absolutely free. Uh, well, free and free. It's like free like free because you've got to sign up on our website, right? And we got you for marketing purposes. So if you don't want to do that, that's okay. <laughs> but uh, this free book will change your life and your career and make you 10 times more powerful. So maybe you take a chance. You know, you can give, a give maybe a false email or something like that. So that's my 1040 break. So uh, I'll wind down. So I, and I would have liked to have spent 20 minutes on this, but uh, I, I tried to write down principles for fighting the unknowns, right? And maybe you know a good hour of going through these one by one might be nice, but at least I've given you a you know that's the summary, the set of principles. How do we fight the unknowns? Right there. Okay, uh, I like this too. Everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Be kind. Uh, okay, be kind always. And uh, uh, finally, uh, this we just added after lunch with Jakob yesterday. Uh, uh, just for fun, we were talking about uh, what, what is known as the quality of life. So this is like quality of user experience. Okay? And uh, so uh, I've I written a book called uh, Life Design, just for fun. And that's me uh, at my summer cabin in Norway, by the way. Uh, you'll notice this little 42 here. And how many people know what 42 is? Yeah, right. Okay. So my Polish friends honored me with a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. Gift got it in London. From her. Your husband. From her husband. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But it's, it's going to get darker before I finish here. <laughs> So uh, if you want to design your life or your career, uh, you might enjoy this. It's the same methods, but scaled down and simplified so anybody can use it. So I showed you some complex stuff because that's what's necessary for handling gigantic projects like Hold of Poland. But we can use exactly these same clear thinking engineering methods for engineering your life. But we don't say that, we just call it life design. Okay, so I wrote the book out. I wrote this this summer. Actually, I wrote five books this summer, and I enjoy meeting people after I haven't seen since summer. And they say, I say, ask me what I did this summer. Ask me what I did this summer. So Paul said, what did you do this summer? I said, I wrote five books. I said, you did. I did. <laughs> this is one of them. 
Okay. Now, uh, I'm, uh, being from Norway, we are very, very proud not only to have the world champion in chess, in case you didn't notice a few days ago, for the fifth year running, Mr. Magnus Carlsen, but we're very proud to be either number one or two in the United Nations Survey of Quality of Life every year. That's not bad. See, when I, when I entered Norway as an immigrant in 1958, they were very poor and had very bad condition after the war. Maybe like Poland, right? But of course, uh, I entered Norway and then they went up to number one in happiness. There got to be a correlation there somewhere, I'm sure. I haven't figured out how to prove it yet, okay? But isn't that wonderful? Wouldn't, wouldn't you like to be there? Now, here's my question to you. Where is Poland in 156 nations on the quality of life survey? Anybody like to suggest the answer? What? What? You've got 110 nations for you, but I think you can do better. Okay? Actually, there are 50,000 Pol Polish uh, people in Norway right now uh, learning about our happiness. Maybe they'll come back and teach you. Okay? So, end of. Uh, I also have the link to my talk and video from last year, and uh, also the link to these. Thank you very much. Have a nice break.